Hello, welcome to today's webinar, Controlled Lighting for Accurate Color. Presenting today is Mark Gunlock, a solution architect at x -Ray Pantone. I'm Robert Grotant, the Global Technical Marketing Manager, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Before we begin, if you have any questions during this webinar at all, please use the questions form to submit your question. We won't be taking any live questions during this short webinar, but we will be sure to follow up with you after the webinar takes place. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mark to get things started. Thanks, Robert. Let's get into it right now. So for starters, color is a critical component of packaging. The use of color is intended to influence the buyer of the product. For some products, incorrect color could imply that the product is not fresh or perhaps it's even counterfeit. Color is more important for some products, for example, cosmetics or luxury goods. We have instruments and software for evaluating color. However, we also use visual inspection to consider various lighting conditions. The print industry has specified instrument measurement conditions as well as visual evaluation conditions that are aligned so that your measurement will correlate better with your visual judgment of color. ISO 3664 is the graphic industry viewing condition and it's aligned with the color measurement condition M1, which is part of the color measurement standard ISO 13665 for a true D50 color illuminant measurement condition. For production areas, it's important to have a good, well-maintained viewing booth or fixture at the press. This includes replacement of the fluorescent lamps based on the manufacturer's recommended hours of use. Just because they still light up does not mean that they're still, they're still putting out the correct light. For quality evaluation, quality departments often use a dedicated viewing booth or box to view under additional lighting conditions. For example, some brand owners may also specify that the printed package matching must also be evaluated under D50 as well as store fluorescent lighting. In some cases, it's useful to see how the product packaging will look under traditional home incandescent lighting. Some of these systems will also include a UV light source that can be used to see how much optical brightener is present in the paper. As you can see in these examples, the color of the light impacts the appearance of the color of the printed piece. Notice the spectral curve for the D50 that illustrates that uh, a lot of light energy is across the full visible spectrum. This is the print industry standard, and it resembles what you'd see under natural daylight conditions. Notice how the red graphics look, along with the sky blue and the grass green. Now look at the store lighting example. In this case, we use a common cool white fluorescent lamp. The graph shows that the light has a lot of yellow-green light energy. Notice the shifts in the color of the red graphic, the blue sky, and the green grass. Now look at the traditional home incandescent lighting. The graph shows a strong bias of light towards yellow, orange, and red. Notice how that affects the sky and the grass. By the way, think of all the different lighting that you have in your facility. Now you should see why we can't just, we can't properly judge color under all these different lighting conditions. We need to make sure that anyone judging color has a good D50 viewing area. A metameric pair is a condition where two samples match under one lighting condition, but they don't match under other conditions. This can happen unintentionally when inks are formulated visually under one lighting condition. A real problem arises when a package includes components that are produced with different inks for different print production. Imagine a folding carton printed on an offset press. It contains a bottle with a label that was printed on a Flexo narrow web press. If the inks are not formulated with software that can optimize the match, considering multiple lighting conditions, it's possible that you'll get a box and a label that match perfectly under D50, but they look very different under store light. So let's look at how that works and how visual inspection can be helpful. 
This is an example of a metameric pair. In this case, it's by design. This is a sticker used to identify D50 lighting conditions. The top and bottom halves of this patch are formulated from different pigments to have a visual match under D50 daylight, but they do not match under the lighting conditions. If we measure the top and the bottom halves, we see in our measurement software that the LAB values within the tolerance ellip ellipse of two delta E here, and it's a common tolerance in the print industry, and we can see the LAB values are pretty close here. The top of the patch, top patch is in the center of this graphic, and the bottom half is slightly to the lower left uh, from that. So they're really close. Now, so right here. So now on the, the uh, other side here, we've got a graph showing the spectral reflectance curves of these patches, and they cross over several times. This is a clue that the colors will not match under the lighting conditions. Under D50, they're going to match. So you can see here with the, uh, the, the uh, daylight sunlight here, they do match. However, if we switch to fluorescent store lighting, now they don't match so well. The fact that the curves cross over was a good indicator that they weren't going to match, but having a good viewing booth allowed us to view and validate if this match is going to be acceptable or not. If this was uh, intended to be used as a, on a cosmetics product, do you think this change would be acceptable? Another consideration is the use of optical brighteners on our paper. Most papers and many folding carton boards contain agents to make them appear brighter and whiter. These work by absorbing light from the invisible UV part of the spectrum and then reflecting it back in the visible part of the spectrum usually within the blue range. In this example, the image on the left shows the same graphic reproduced on the folding carton and on an inkjet proof. On the right, illuminated only by UV light, we can see that the production stock contains an optical brightening additive and the proof does not. Another important consideration is how we perceive colors. Take a look at the patch here in the front. What would you call that color? Okay, now take a look at this patch on top. What would you refer to that color as? They're clearly different colors, right? Well, actually they're the same. But the surrounding colors impacted our judgment. Let's go back and look at that again. You couldn't even force yourself to believe these are the same colors looking at this, even though you know that they are just the same color. So when judging color, you'll need to isolate the color from others to avoid this phenomenon. So it's important to have a defined procedure that everyone can follow. You need to make sure that the lamps and the fixture comply with ISO 3664 so that they'll align with the measurement standards. Then measure then measured color differences will correlate better with visual color differences. ISO defines that that specific lamp is D50 and includes a specific amount of UV. The booth must also have a neutral surround. You also need to provide a 45 degree angle of view to eliminate the spectral highlight. If your booth is set up like the example on the left, The users may need to adjust their height to achieve the, achieve the best angle. This is not always easy to do. The option on the right allows the user to adjust their angle by stepping closer or further from the booth. It's also a good idea to test the viewer. One common test is the Munsell uh, FM100 test. The user will sort out color tiles that have very color differences that are in the range between color tiles that are fixed at either end of these strips. The results are then scored and graphed. If the graph shows only small bumps near the middle, then the user has normal color discrimination. If, however, there are bigger spikes, this will indicate that the user is not able to discriminate color well. 
In this example, the person is not able to judge color very well in the yellows and the blues. Lastly, you need to make sure you're taking care of the color guides that are being used. Let's talk a little more about that. So there's a lot of different kind of guides that you can use. You're all probably familiar with the Pantone Fan Deck and other brand printed um, standards that are like in the form of cards and such that get distributed. The concern with these is that they're all printed typically on a printing press. So by nature, there's gonna be some variation from print to print. There's no two that are absolutely alike. Another commonly used item is the ink room proof. Well, these are notoriously uneven across the proof. Then there's the uh, often called LSD or light standard dark. And users need to be very careful about subjectivity when using these. The light and dark examples here on this card are not intended to be alternative targets. They're defining the limits of acceptability. So those are right on the edge of failure. Now, you should also be aware that all these physical guides will fade over time and they're subject to fingerprints and dirt. So they need to be kept clean uh, and put away when they're not being used. So all physical guides are prone to these limitations and that's why we must also maintain digital standards for the use within our instruments for measurement QC. Now I'm sure you can all identify several issues with this situation. In addition to the clutter in the booth that will impact the color judgment and the fact that the user is not even properly viewing the samples in the booth, there are samples lying about, fading in the sunlight. But notice that she's also wearing tinted glasses and her bright red jacket is reflecting in the samples. Color assessors must avoid tinted lenses and they must wear neutral colors like a gray or a white lab coat. All right, well, that concludes my slide presentation. I thank you for your time. Here's various ways you can contact us with any questions you might have. Perfect, thank you, Mark. As Mark said, yes, once again, if you do have any questions, please feel free to submit them using the questions function to the left of this video. Again, we'd like to thank everyone for your time and please have a great rest of your day.